I'll give my I'll give a brief introduction. Uh, so my name is Michael Wood. Uh, I go by WP Scholar online, so you can find me that way at Twitter, and uh, it's my domain, and so on and so on. Um, so what I do, I actually um, primarily do WordPress development. So I do. I started out doing a lot of uh, PHP backend development, um, and then WordPress came out with. Oh uh, well. It's not officially in core, but uh, they have their JSON API. Uh, so they have um, now gotten to where things are kind of decoupling uh, to where you can actually do a lot of JavaScript work uh, with WordPress um, just using their JSON API. So um, that's how I kind of got into a lot of um, what I do now um, with front end. Um, I had originally. Uh, started out tinkering with jQuery like everyone else probably did. And uh, eventually, um, with a WordPress plugin that actually had some JavaScript in there, the first real uh, jQuery code. And uh, that plugin kind of took off. Didn't break for a long time, uh, much to my amazement. So. Um, I had originally uh, gotten hired on uh, to work with a guy, and uh, he touted me as the JavaScript expert just because I had written that one little little plugin, uh, which was not the case. But I was thrown into uh, uh, having to learn a good bit of it. So that's kind of uh, kind of where I've come from. I've gotten thrown into a lot of projects and had to just figure out what's going on and uh, and go with it. So um, this project was nothing different. Um, so let me, let me start by just kind of giving you a little background on the project we had. So this was a surprise project. Um, so basically what we were doing is we had a client that had very specific needs um, and they wanted essentially the ability to create a page that had very, um, uh, very specific modules and components that they could just do data entry for and have them show up on the page. So we had a lot of that being powered by WordPress itself, um, but we decided um, to, because Backbone is actually a part of WordPress, we decided to use Backbone and the REST API to, uh, to kind of create this custom interface and ability for them to easily um, do things. And, and we were trying to create a library that we could use to, you know, easily add in components or modules uh, to this page builder and for other clients to be able to do similar things. And actually, um, we ended up having to, to evolve it yet again for the same client, different project. Um, so, station is going to have actual code from this project. Everything that you see on the screen today will be pulled directly from the project um, that I'm describing, um, flaws included. So. Um, and I'm always open to uh, constructive criticism. Uh, lots of things I could. Do. So if anybody has any uh, input, don't don't feel like uh, uh, you're going to offend me if you want to bring it up. So um, so I would be uh, kind of walking you through just the basics of what I did to kind of set up the project, what kind of uh, things I was using, um, and then we'll kind of go into. Um, the lessons I've learned from, from that. So to start, obviously, I use Backbone. So Backbone obviously has models and views and collect. Um, but of course, act, we're actually just going to use Backbone models and the collections. Um, and of course, one of the things with Backbone is that uh, underscore JS is a dependency. It gives you the ability to do things like have a um, it has a template function which allows you to pass in data and essentially have a, a basic templating engine. Um, so we were using that uh, before we made the switch to React. Uh, React, um, React is kind of, we're obviously using React components because that's kind of the way it works. It actually replaced um, a whole lot of files for us <laughs> because uh, Every component we add in, we're eliminating a template and a view. Um, so we're cutting in half, uh, or maybe a quarter, I guess, uh, of the files just automatically by making that switch. Um, and one of the things that React does, it actually made us, uh, allowed us to do things in a lot cleaner way, so we actually had less code. 
Um, but of course, with React, one of the things that you run into is this thing called JSX. And JSX requires that you process that before you can use it um, as standard JavaScript. So uh, we were using Gulp as our task runner. Um, and Browserify, uh, it was actually the first time I had used Browserify. Um, but I really like the fact that you can use node modules on the front end. Um, so, and the other cool thing that Browserify did for us was um, allow us to use uh, Reactify. Um, now, my understanding now is that Babel was kind of the way to go, but uh, at the time, uh, it was what we went with. And so we um, we use the, it's basically a Browserify transform. So you can just transform off to Browserify, um, and essentially we'll inject um, some extra functionality, which will transform your JSX into actual JavaScript so that it can run um, in the browser. And then, of course, Browserify will bundle all your little node modules into something that can also be used on the front end, um, which the nice thing is it also isolates all your code. And then we use this thing called Backbone React Component. And it's essentially a library or a mix-in that you can use with Backbone, um, which basically will add um, or kind of plugs backbone models and views, uh, well not models and views, models and collections into your React components. So any questions about setup or any of that? I think that's pretty straightforward. Most of you are, know all of that already. Um, one of the things though that was probably difficult uh, <laughs> hitch that I hit in this was actually trying to get, initially get uh, Browserify to do the Reactify stuff. Um, there's all kinds of posts out there online and I tried each one of them wholesale and uh, couldn't get any of them to work. I ended up having to, to custom write something that was a combination of everything. So, so, then, so then the next thing I is uh, there's the JSX, right? So you're, uh, JSX is a new thing uh, when you get into React for the first time, and you've got to figure out what it is and how it works and all that kind of good stuff. So uh, JSX is basically a JavaScript and XML mutation, I guess, or uh, uh, mutant, I guess, if you want to call it. Uh, <laughs> so th think if you're if you're familiar with XML, uh, you know, take some of those concepts and blend it with JavaScript. Uh, and a little bit of HTML, and you've got JSX. <laughs> um, so one of the first things that you um, you realize is that uh, just like XML, you have to have a root element uh, in order for things to work. Uh, so what that means is, um, you know, I've got two components here, um, but I have to wrapped in a root element. So we put it inside of a div. Um, otherwise, JSX is going to puke at us. So, um, and um, and you don't want to put just text in there, right? So you don't want to just put text and try to try to do that. It's got to actually be inside of an element. So in that regard, you know, it's very similar to XML. You've got to have that root element in there. One of the other things that uh, will catch you off guard, and um, it's it's is they catch you off guard, right? So when you're using JSX, uh, have a self-closing tag. You have to make sure you actually put the little slash on there. If you don't put the slash on there, um, it's technically not valid. Um, uh, you know, XH, XHTML, right? So it's got to, it's, it's more strict. The next thing was, um, you know, I go in thinking, okay, this is just like HTML, so I can. It, it looks like I can just use normal HTML, and um, you know, occasionally throw in a little component or something here, and it should work. Um, but there are instances, particularly with the attributes uh, class, them um, cla uh, attributes are camel case. So instead of being able to do class equals whatever, uh, you have to do class name in camel case, and then pass in your name. Uh, so everything is basically camel case, uh, except for data, uh, like your HTML5 data attributes, and uh, area 
tags or uh, attributes. This is kind of my, uh, what I call them, magic, magic attributes. Uh, essentially anything where React uh, is handling the, the value for that attribute uh, is not going to have quotes in it. This threw me for a while um, because, you know, every other thing engine uh, that you use, you know, you just drop in, just like mustache, right, or handlebars, you just drop in wherever you want it, and it will put it there. Uh, so, so I'm thinking, well, if I want this to show up, I just stick it inside those quotes. But that is not the case. Um, you want to make sure that, that, is, that you don't quote those. So then you have um, attributes, Boolean attributes, right? So something where normally you would have uh, an element, for example, a button, where disabled, which is normally just an attribute without a value. Um, you can also do disabled equals disabled, um, and that is valid HTML as well. Um, in this case, what React or JSX does for you is it will allow you to do disabled equals and then actually pass in a Boolean value or uh, do some sort of evaluation in there uh, that evaluates to a Boolean. True, the attribute name disabled gets put in, or if that evaluates to false, it's just removed altogether. Um, so it's a, it's a nice, cool way of being able to toggle those things. And then we have form fields. So form fields were a little, little, um, took a little, were probably the thing that took a little longer to get used to. Um, so for starters, you know, your normal inputs will have a value um, and so on. But when you get into things like a text area, the value is usually inside of a, um, it's, it's not a self-closing tag, which you see I've highlighted here that in JSX it's actually a self -closing tag. Um, Normally, it's a, it has an opening and closing tag, and the value would be in whatever's inside of there. Um, in JSX, it's actually a self-closing tag, and you can actually just pass a value, like element, and it will actually put that correctly in as a text array with the value in the opening and closing tag when it gets completely rendered. And with the select field, it's the same way. So normally, you'd have to, um, you know, I know in PHP, if I'm outputting something, I have to loop through each option and check and see if this option value happens to match this thing. Um, JSX allows you just to pass a value directly on the select element, and it will set that for me, um, uh, correctly select the, the option element. So when you're, when you're rendering, uh, you also have the ability to do um, binary operators. So you can, and this is a very simple example, right? So um, in this case, I want to maybe render a button and maybe render a thumbnail. Uh, so I can basically call it says, um, or uh, I have state on the uh, component which says, should I show the button or should I show the thumbnail? And then depending on what that evaluates to, I can run my render button or render thumbnail, which will, um, which will return HTML, JSX, HTML, and, uh, or it'll return null. And if you return null, it won't display anything. So it's a nice, easy way of um, adding that very clean conditional logic that's easy to read, um, but also very powerful. And then one of the things that, that you quickly once you uh, start working with multiple items is that um, there's this important thing called a create a component and you for each item display or create a component uh, send a key so that act can tell between each of those items and essentially um, what happens is, um, so react uses the virtual DOM which I, I don't know how what that actually means. So my understanding of it is that um, so you have your actual DOM and then it keeps two copies of 
the DOM for itself, called the virtual DOM, which aren't really the real thing, it's just their copy of it. So they take the DOM, uh, and they say this is the original, and they take the new one, and this is this is the new version. And essentially, this is just an object. And so these keys are basically saying, you know, if you think JSON, you don't have a key, um, you know, you've got an array of things, and you can't really tell the difference between them. So uh, as the key is important, and you want to make sure that you use that any time that you have multiple components or items being generated. And as far as React basics, um, so these are the the things that I. Um, some of them are common sense. I think once you get into React, uh, for example, the render method is a weird thing. Uh, a component that doesn't render anything is kind of useless. Uh, so the render method is is required. Um, so I'm actually putting in some, uh, well, I've got some more examples of, of as we go forward, um, of actually how we're integrating Backbone with this. Um, the next next main thing here is that um, ideally you'll have an one-way data flow. So React is designed so that you pass things into components and they basically traverse down from their parents to their children and all the way down to uh, wherever they need to go. Um, so then kind of the next big I ran into was uh, really understanding what are props, what is state, and what's the difference. Um, they had, so, sometimes they have the same thing on them, particularly when I was working with this Backbone React component. Uh, it would set things up a certain way, and I could get at things um, more than one way. Um, and I, you know, I get confused about, well, you know, what is a prop? I, I get the idea of state. I know what state is. Um, I know what properties are, but, you know, what, what is the real difference and why should I use one over the other? So essentially, properties are, well, easy. State's internal, right? State doesn't live anywhere outside of your React component. Um, nothing outside of your component can impact the state uh, directly. Uh, so props are essentially external. Those are those things that are passed down into the computer. Um, they can be kind of viewed as the source of truth. Um, props might help define what it is, um, but state is, can be mutated. Props are immutable, right? So you're not going to go changing props from within the component. You can change props, um, but usually if the, you know, something happens and the parent says, oh, we need to change the props on this, you can, you can, you can send something back up and have it trickle back down, um, and then it would basically re-render, create a new copy of that, in which case the props would be different. Um, you need to have a current version of that and be able to, to change the state, then that's how you do Easiest to understand explanation, but uh, any, anybody have any questions about that or anything I've mentioned so far? So once you kind of get the idea of okay, props, immutable um, state, uh, it's in people don't pass in all the be expecting or the uh, the state. Uh, you know, it has to be set up initially. So, React gives you two two methods here, essentially. Uh, get default props, which will basically set up your props for your... Um, so, if the user doesn't pass in something, you can make sure it's set. And, um, get initial state. Get initial state allows you to set up whatever setup you need to do. Um, so in case you can kind of see how these things are interacting, um, you know, props are defined um, and accessible when you're setting up your state. Uh, so if the user happened to pass in the default post type, uh, then whatever they passed in is available. Otherwise, it's going to be this empty string. The state, I can say, what is my post type? And it says whatever props default post type is. Um, and then if I need to, for any reason, change the post type, um, since state is it can be mutated, um, I can do that at any point throughout my component. 
So once you kind of get that that down, then you have this idea of prop types. So you have very good control over state, but props get passed in, and sometimes they aren't what you expect, right? So you want to make sure that you get the right data type. So prop types is essentially something that you'd set on your component, and it's just a object, um, and you give it the names, the keys, or essentially the names of things that you have that are the values that you pass in. Uh, React uh, has again to React dot prop type. Um, and they have different types of things you can you can set. So react.proptypes.string on the middle one there will tell you I'm expecting a string. Um, the bottom one there, react.proptypes.func is a function. And then you can see that we've appended the dot requ is required, which basically tells us that if somebody creates a component and doesn't pass this in, then we need to throw an error and say, You've got to pass whatever this function is in. Uh, so in this case, it's expecting an on change. Um, so if you don't pass that function, if you don't pass in a function, it won't it won't take it. And then in this case, we have a function. so this is of course a backbone collection. So in this post type collection, it extends from backbone collection. Uh, and of course that is also required for this thing to work. So then there's this concept of controlled components. Um, and then you can go and, and read the documentation on React website. And it, it tries to explain this, um, but it still doesn't do that very well. Uh, so it took me a while to, to, to really understand and make sure uh, I knew what to expect. Uh, when dealing with this. So basically you have the ability to set value uh, and this is a text area. Um, so you can set value or you can also set default value. If you set default value, which is a camel case uh, of course, uh, default value, whatever you pass in, will be the initial value of that field um, and then whatever the user enters after that that's that's just you know you, you, you're not especially you don't you would use that when you're not going to be changing the field you're just the user's going to type in you might it, but you're not going to update that that field value um, directly there uh, control components when you have a value uh, you should always have an on change event if you set a value and you don't have an on change event um, basically what happens is I go to start typing in the field. And I can type all I want, but it still says whatever it was initially set to. So if the value happened to be test, when I start typing additional things on the end of that, it's just going to constantly say test. Um, and my first experience in that, it was kind of strange typing in a field and having absolutely nothing change. Um, and of course, that's what the on change is for. The on change uh, callback. Uh, whatever you need to do, which in this case would probably be to update the model, uh, or I, in this case, um, so you would update the state of that and maybe the state would uh, change other things at some point. So nested components, so as soon as it may seem, I didn't realize that you could actually do this when I started using it. Um, that you could actually have a component and pack components inside of those. And, uh, so, um, it's pretty simple. Uh, HTML, and then you have your React components. Whenever you've named a React component, you can use it just like an HTML uh, tag. So, uh, in this case, you have an example of sortable component, which is basically um, I'm passing in a backbone collection and make it sortable essentially. So this uh, this component is a wrapper uh, that allows me to to make something sortable, drag and drop. Uh, and as you can see, it has an open and a closing tag because it's wrapping this this other functionality. And then I can have this dynamic collection component, uh, which normally in backbone uh, you'll set the model that you're 
collection. So you'll have this uh, collection of a bunch of books or uh, whatever it happens to be you're working with. Um, in this case, we have all these different, um, so as part of the we have all these different uh, types of modules that we want the user to be able to add uh, and to work with. So we have a collection, a backbone collection, which actually dynamically um, generates uh, different types of models, and those models also need to be translated into the correct uh, components. So we have this dynamic collection component, which will actually all of these things and make sure that they, uh, it's essentially a factory that, that generates the correct components for each type of item that we have. Uh, of course, that one is any children, so I, it could have wanted to pass children or it In closing, things end, um, but if you just use it as a self closing tag. So, kind of on the flip side of being able to put um, to nest components, you also have to have the ability to um, figure out what to do with those, those nested components. So, basically, when you say this.props.children, We'll go through and render those individual components uh, that get passed in. And then there are life cycle methods. So this is uh, is not really something that Backbone gives you. Uh, so this is might be new to some people. I'd actually worked with Ember a little bit, uh, and it gives you similar functionality. Um, but basically, the idea is that you know, as things are being added and removed from the DOM, uh, as different things are happening in your application, uh, there are methods that are provided for you automatically that if you just um, put things within there, um, it'll automatically fire at the right point in time. So, in the concept of a React component, um, typically it, it is directly uh, if you have a component. It has its collection DOM element or collection elements, uh, and you want to know what component will mount will do is actually tell you when that DOM element has been rendered and is attached to the DOM. Uh, so this is always when you're in this function right here, your component has already been rendered, has been attached to the DOM, and you can now. Uh, work with um, doing any setup that you might need to do. Uh, so, in certain cases, I've ha I had um, things that need to be able to read the DOM based on what was generated. Uh, so, this is to do that. In this case, we're setting up some uh, collection data and fetching some things uh, where it would be very non performant to do so before those things had been added. Um, so this really helps make sure that you do things at the right point. And of course, there's things like component will unmount, in which case something is a So if there's some sort of cleanup that you need to do uh, before that gets removed, you can do that with that. And there's a number of other ones, but those are probably the most common ones that you will, will use. Component will mount, component did mount, component will unmount, component did unmount, um, and so on. So then, um, how do we access the DOM? So you've got a component, it's been rendered. How do we read or work with um, what's been generated? Uh, so in this case, uh, this is there's a library called jQuery Tay. And what it does is it's a, uh, you can pick a text area and, and essentially turn it into a uh, WYSIWYG. Uh, editor. And so this little component, what it's doing is it's trying to figure out what content there is. Uh, so it's getting the DOM node, so you see this dot get DOM node. Um, we pass it off to jQuery so we can f traverse the, uh, the actual rendered HTML and figure out what's inside of it. Apparently at this point, I think that get DOM node has been deprecated and now you would use react DOM dot find DOM node and pass in your component and it would spit out essentially the same thing. Um, don't manipulate the dump. <laughs> so you can access it. Uh, it's a bad idea to try and manipulate it from underneath React. 
you want React to manipulate the DOM for you because it's going to do it faster. It's going to do it in a very performant way. But when you do it directly, you're going to also screw up the virtual DOM and uh, and how it how it updates. So you can change markup and then trigger something for React to re-render, and then things don't work right. Things don't change. Uh, things get just kind of disappear. On you. Um, you don't really want to manipulate the DOM. You can read it, you can access it, uh, but it's a bad idea to manipulate it. Uh, it is possible to manipulate it and put it back the way it was before React does its stuff, uh, but again, it's, it's really not the best way to go. And then one of the things um, that I ran into is, you know, normally you'd, when you're using React, uh, the easiest way to do it with JSX is you would actually reference um, kind of like those HTML tags that represent your components and pass in these that need to be passed in. But there are cases where you don't know what component really should be rendered at a particular point in time. So you need to be able to do that dynamically. Actually use react.createFactory. Uh, which typically is the way that you kind of initiate your, um, um, what should we call it, your application attaching it initially to the to the DOM. Uh, you'd have the factory. Well, actually, I'm sorry, not create factory. Create element is how you do that. Create factory. What it does is you pass in the name of a component, which in this case we're passing in a component name, and then it will generate a factory. When I do new and pass in some props, it will generate that particular uh, particular component with whatever attributes I've passed in. And of course, you can see down here um, that we're triggering an error if for some reason uh, an invalid component type was provided. So, so React plus Backbone. How do we take React and some of these new things that we've learned and actually integrate with Backbone in a nice, easy way? So as I mentioned, the uh, Backbone React component, as you can see my uh, require up there, I've got React, React Backbone, or Backbone React component, and then finally I have a uh, component which is required there, which is actually a component that my app has created, and we're putting it in. So this is a collection component, right? So uh, think collection view, I guess, in Backbone. So what we're doing is we're taking our collection and we are minute, uh, so under our render method, mapping it and, and rendering a component. So the thing here is just basically use the mix-in functionality, uh, the React class, and pass in this backbone, uh, backbone React component mix-in. And by doing that, Essentially, what happens is it automatically takes your models and collections and makes them available within the React component. Um, so when you instantiate a component, you just pass in uh, model equals and then hand off your back, backbone model, or an equals hand off your backbone collection, and that gets passed in. The interesting thing is that um, you can pass in a model at a high level, go through several nested components without passing the model down and the model is still available. It basically figures out what the most recent model was. So that kind of threw me. I don't know if that's technically the way that it should work um, from from a pure like React uh, architecture, uh, but it does work. So, uh, so you, can, you can do this, that get collection. Uh, you can also do uh, this dot props dot collection that gets set on the property. And you can actually also do this dot state dot collection. Um, questions about this right here? Can everybody read that? I, mean, I think it might be kind of small, but it's kind of small. <laughs> so um, let's see. So accessing the collection data. I just hit on that, did I not? Oh, yeah. So this .get collection basically gives you your backbone collection, uh, and then again process and 
and work with that. So in this case, we're, we're processing each item in the collection. We're calling this dot render component. And so we're dynamically using the create factory uh, method and setting up the props and then creating a new component uh, on the fly. And then this is the uh, that, um, yeah, so we have an icon component. We're just setting up the props. Uh, we're using the factory to, uh, to allow us to have control over the properties that get set and passed in because they're going to be different. Uh, and this is, this is basically what's being rendered. Nothing complicated. Uh, React class, it just reads whatever properties are there and gives you an on-click cl on uh, callback. Um, so then as far as accessing model data, um, as I mentioned, you know, you this dot get model kind of you have this dot, um, or you can access it like this, this dot props dot model, um, you can use your dot get. Uh, so that is all the slides I have. Um, any questions or want to actually look at any of the code, maybe in larger format? <laughs> You're saying never mutate the DOM, but what happens if you need to plug in that it's not React? Like, I'm sure that jQuery text editor plugin Right, exactly. And that that was one of the real frustrations that I had because I wanted to, I needed to figure out. what's in and then allows you to drag and drop things and then the important thing is not so much that you don't it, it's the rule isn't so much that you don't mutate the DOM at all the key is that if you do mutate the DOM that whatever happens in react exactly so in the example of jQuery sortable, when I was working with that, I had it set up to where, you know, you do your drag and drop, and sure, jQuery sortable, you actually drop it there, and it, need, and it changes the DOM, the actual DOM. Um, but what it also does is it gives you that callback. So jQuery sortable, what we were doing is we're using the callback from that to update the collection in Backbone, which would then update the React uh, rendered component and would render it the same way in which it had been moved, dragged and dropped. So, so you don't want to just go start changing things in the experiment to stay the render. It's going to go back. Any other questions? Yes. So, yeah, so basically, so React has a copy of the original copy of the DOM, which is essentially whatever the DOM's current state should match um, React's original, right? Um, so React's basically taking the DOM and kind of turning it into a JSON object that matches the current state of the DOM. And then you have another copy, which is um, React's current state, right? So pre-render, whatever mutations have happened in React, this is the JSON object that represents that. So now we do a diff and we figure out, okay, based on this, we only need to change these elements in the DOM. So it's not that React literally re-renders the whole page, it does a diff and only re-renders just the markup that's changed. Right. So basically, when React goes to re-render, if, if the diff says that certain things have changed, but you've changed things that are outside of that, they're going to still be there that same way because React hasn't re-rendered that part. But React is not in sync with it. 
So that's where things get really off code. Yeah, you know, I'm also confused. So, uh, like on the on chain, you're saying if you don't actually update the internal state that an input is bound to, then it looks like that it does nothing, right? Right. Okay, but I mean, like the browser's default action, right, is to go to like insert those characters. So, I'm so confused about. Well, that's that's the thing is is that the the browser does insert those characters, um, but React renders so fast that it feels like you're not doing anything um, because what's happening is you're typing, and uh, and you know if if React is re-rendering, which it you know, then essentially what's happening is it's it's re-rendering with the exact same state it had before, which was whatever it was before you started typing. Um, so, I'm trying to think what that is. Yeah, I think, I think there's a, right. I think it's essentially has kind of a built-in on it, it does when there's a value set. Essentially, as you're, you've set a value, um, you know it's it's essentially re-rendering that. Um, I'm off on that, but <laughs> as, my, as best as I can figure, that's what I see happening. Um, WP Scholar uh, on Twitter. I'll post those if you if you want the slides. So, um, and if you have questions that you just don't want to ask here, feel free to post on Twitter or get in contact with me however so but any other uh, questions